So we'll warmly welcome and big hand to Oran Young. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if this um, microphone is working. Can you hear me fine? <clears throat> well, I came prepared for a sort of informal seminar <laughs> in which I could say a few things which would uh, catalyze vigorous discussion <laughs> um, in a sort of a academic scientific sense. But um, it's great that everyone is here. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I just uh, want to talk to you about research opportunities. And I'll try to talk for, give or take, 40 minutes. Uh, and then we can have some um, conversation back and forth. Well, the, my point of departure is that um, uh, uh, focusing on um, international environmental regimes, governance systems, uh, whatever you like, which has been a focus of a lot of interest in the social science research community for several decades now. And uh, I published in December a um, article on the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, which is kind of a state-of-the-art article. And uh, my hope is that a fair number of you will have read that article. And I kind of hope to sort of take that as a point of departure and say, if that's the current state of the art, uh, where do we go from there uh, in terms of research opportunities? You know, what, what do I see as the sort of growth areas or places where we can really make um, progress. So <clears throat> for all those who are active researchers or uh, even in search of thesis topics and so on, uh, here are some of my thoughts about uh, where we might make progress. I wanted to divide my comments into two parts. Um, the first part is kind of looking at individual regimes as the unit of analysis and to say what are some of the growth areas, what are some of the places where we might push to broaden and deepen our understanding of the universe of cases of individual regimes. And the second part of what, I've, what I wanted to say is kind of looking at some sort of broader questions uh, in which we focus not just on the individual regime as a unit of analysis, but on kind of broader institutional linkages and relationships and say, well, are there some growth areas, opportunities uh, there as well? Uh, so uh, with that as background, let me um, move forward to the first part of this presentation. Um, Looking at the universe of cases of international regimes, and by the way, my own research is focused particularly on international environmental regimes, but I want to say some things that are about regimes more generally and possibly some similarities and differences between environmental regimes and regimes in other areas like economic regimes or security regimes and so on. Uh, what I want to stress in looking at the universe of cases of uh, individual international regimes is the, uh, the, the idea of, of mechanisms or sort of going beyond empirical generalizations and trying to understand the causal mechanisms that are uh, at play or that are uh, explaining or leading to producing, shall we say, generating uh, 
uh, the uh, associations that we see in the empirical generalizations. Now, when we talk about the effectiveness of international regimes, environmental or otherwise, we are, there's a lot of debate in the community. If you read the PNAS paper, you'll know. But, but let's just say in rough and ready terms, we're thinking about the extent to which regimes make a difference in terms of problem solving, whether they actually contribute uh, in some significant way to solving the problem, whether it's overfishing or the loss of stratospheric ozone or climate change or whatever it may be. Uh, but in order to contribute to solving problems, uh, in every case, it's necessary to play some role in shifting or guiding or directing the behavior of the key players involved, whether those are individual human beings in the case of fishers or whether they're collective actors in other cases or what have you. So when we look at mechanisms, uh, I'm trying to understand the behavioral mechanism, the way in which regimes uh, play a role in directing, guiding, steering uh, the behavior of the uh, key players. And uh, in terms of opportunities for research, I want to say some things about the mecha mechanisms that are associated with the uh, traditional um, categories of power, interests, and ideas. Many of those of you who are familiar with the international relations literature will recognize that triad as, as a sort of classic uh, set of categories of forces at work that uh, can explain or account for uh, what happens uh, in uh, international relations. So turning first then to the, um, to the idea of power or to the issues that grow out of uh, questions of power, there's a, there's a sense in the international relations community that people who study regimes, governance systems, environmental or otherwise, have tended to um, downplay the role of power, not to have um, given sufficient attention or paid sufficient attention to the role of power. And so there's a sense in which there's an opportunity to kind of look more carefully uh, at the role of power. Now, there's a, there's a school of thought uh, in international relations that says that institutions, regimes, don't matter at all because it's all about power. And that regimes are simply epiphenomena. I don't want to get into that debate at all. I want to talk about uh, power within regimes rather than power over regimes. And here are a couple of areas that I think are, uh, are interesting. Um, one is to think about the role of leadership. Um, and you might, for those of you who are familiar with this literature, you might think of uh, leadership in the sense that uh, it was the, the idea was developed by um, Charles Kindleberger um, quite a long time ago in looking at international economic regimes. And so leadership in this context is not just a matter of uh, imposing one's will in a sort of raw power sense, but, but what do leaders uh, do? Well, uh, leaders do various things in uh, economic regimes, like, for example, supplying a reserve currency or setting standards that uh, others can follow. In other words, they perform roles in the context of uh, regimes that are 
um, important as coordinating mechanisms or as um, setting the standards, the rules of the game uh, that others can follow. And so, um, and this is often a matter of what in the um, political science community people think of as, uh, for example, soft power as opposed to hard power. I'm not, uh, I can't tell exactly who's in this audience and so <laughs> who will be familiar with what part of the sort of terminological apparatus of the field, but we can unpack some of those later on in the question period if you like. Um, and so the question arises as to uh, what are the kind of concrete uh, types of leadership that are particularly important uh, in the uh, area of environmental regimes? I think this is an important question, for example, when we think about uh, current discussions of moving toward uh, a green economy. Um, another opportunity, I think, or area in which there's room for, and, and bear in mind that I'm trying to identify areas where I think there's room for the next phase or the next stage of work beyond what I tried to uh, take stock of in my PNAS article. Uh, another area which I think is really important from the point of view of power uh, has to do with compliance. Um, very often one in the political science literature, there's a sense in which um, compliance is equated with enforcement or with the application of sanctions or penalties of one kind or another. But <clears throat> there are lots of opportunities to make a difference uh, when it comes to um, compliance that are really quite different uh, in character. Uh, one thinks of the so-called non-compliance procedures under the Montreal Protocol of 1987, where it's not a matter of identifying violators and sanctioning them, uh, but identifying um, members of the regime who, for one reason or another, are likely are having difficulty in complying with, for example, phase-out schedules and figuring out what to do to facilitate or to help them um, come into conformance uh, with the rules. And quite a lot of that has to do with um, notions of rewards and promises. And if you think about power, uh, power is not just about um, threats and sanctions, but power is very often about the use of um, promises and rewards. And so there's a question about whether or not those who are the leaders uh, in a regime are in a position to use resources through promises and rewards. In the Montreal Protocol case, you have things like the Montreal Protocol a multilateral fund in which material resources have been used to influence the behavior of actors who otherwise would have a hard time um, adjusting their behavior to be in conformance with the decisions uh, of the meeting of the parties. Uh, and so I think that these questions of the use of power and power, including soft power, uh, within regimes is an area in which there's uh, a lot of room for um, likely significant new research to, to understand the behavioral mechanisms that um, are significant in explaining why some regimes seem to be more effective, more successful than others. Remember that this is all about trying to understand the conditions or the factors that account for relative success or relative uh, effectiveness of these uh, international regimes. So in the triad of power, interests, and ideas, 
Now, the next one is uh, interests. <clears throat> and let me say a few words about opportunities for the next stage in research focusing around issues that deal with, with interest. Um, many of us, of course, think of uh, uh, interests or configurations of interests uh, as the source of the problem rather than the source of the uh, solution. So if you think of things like the tragedy of the commons or the prisoner's dilemma or um, the free rider problem and so on, these are all situations where the problem is a uh, outgrowth is a result of the configuration of interests of the, um, of the various uh, players. Uh, but we also have a literature that I think is uh, important and interesting uh, that explains the dynamic of cooperation in terms of uh, notions of interest. So, for example, you have the idea that goes back to um, people like Hayek, um, who talk about the possibility of um, spontaneous or self-generating social institutions or regimes, uh, extended in more recent times uh, in the work of um, some of the more formalized work of uh, Bob Axelrod, um, some of you may know his work on the evolution of uh, cooperation, in which he has a kind of epidemiological model. It shows that under some conditions, um, once you cross a threshold, um, cooperation can spread within a population um, without some kind of formal negotiated sort of an agreement. And uh, very early in my career, uh, along with several of my earliest uh, PhD students, we developed a model uh, in which we showed that under certain conditions um, there would be opportunities for um, political leaders to uh, play a role in mobilizing resources to supply public goods and to make a profit doing so. Uh, we call this political leadership and, public and collective goods. And some of you will be familiar with um, the notion of people like Tom Schelling, of what he early on called um, K-groups, which is a somewhat similar notion about uh, small groups being able to provide Leadership. Well, this is all uh, about the dynamics of configurations of uh, interest that underlie many um, collective action problems uh, and therefore are highly relevant to understanding not only when regimes, environmental or otherwise, form, uh, but also whether they're effective in solving problems. Now, the question I want to raise in this context, uh, has to do with um, the um, stability of these configurations of interest over time. So if you are looking at a Hayekian world or a world of the sort that Bob Axelrod portrayed in the evolution of cooperation, uh, what does it take to sustain these cooperative configurations over time, or if it's in the context of political leadership and collective goods, uh, do you need continuing injections of leadership, so to say, to um, sustain cooperation even after it's been um, formed? And here I think the questions that are of interest to me, that I see as, um, as intriguing at this point, uh, have to do with the extent to which the, the sustaining of these systems of cooperation, which is what regimes actually uh, are, is best understood in um, utilitarian terms. 
always better understood in terms of things like um, the development of um, standard operating procedures or the development of um, agencies within governments that uh, take as their rationale, their raison d'etre, the administration of a regime uh, independent of whatever might be seen as the uh, national interest of the country involved. And so uh, the, the, the research frontier I'm pointing to in this context uh, has to do with trying to understand uh, how these cooperative configurations are sustained over time and are even able in some uh, situations to survive what seem to be more or less significant or uh, severe um, threats to their effectiveness um, coming from the environment in one form or another. So that's a, a question about um, issues, mechanisms uh, centered around the, the idea of interest. Um, now, turning to the question of um, ideas, um, so in this triad, power, interests, and ideas, uh, what are some of the uh, most interesting questions that I see in the next phase moving forward, going forward with respect to um, research on international regimes, environmental and otherwise. Uh, a question that really intrigues me at this stage is whether um, effective regimes um, must in some way be um, embedded in larger systems of thought. Um, so, for example, security regimes in the post-World War II period have tended to reflect a transition in thinking from notions of national security to notions of collective security. Uh, economic regimes have tended to reflect um, a transition in our kind of underlying mental models, if you like, from uh, autarky to embedded liberalism. And one of the questions we have when we think about environmental regimes is, has there been some such um, uh, transformation which I would see as probably a shift from um, some um, conventional notion of sustainable yields to notions of uh, stewardship, which I know is a concept that has been discussed quite uh, extensively in, in this community uh, here. And the question is, there are two questions. One is in the context of um, environmental arrangements. Have we, in fact, been able to make a transition from the conventional notions of things like sustainable yields to an alternative um, intellectual construct that rests more on what you might think of as um, a concept of, uh, of stewardship. And to the extent that we are kind of hung up in this transition, that is to say, having moved in the direction of the transition, but not fully shifted from one kind of construct construct to another, uh, is this one of the fundamental questions or, or limitations, I should say, that we must struggle with uh, in terms of building more effective uh, environmental regimes to deal with things like the loss of biological diversity uh, and the problem of uh, climate change. And another interesting question uh, surrounding notions of uh, ideas, it seems to me, is is um, um, what happens when the um, guiding discourse, when our foundational cognitive constructs 
begin to um, fray at the edges. Uh, to what extent the, the regimes that rest on the substrate of these cognitive constructs begin to show wear and tear. And here I think there's a particularly interesting uh, set of issues around the um, existing international uh, uh, trade regimes, economic regimes that deal with trade in the broad sense of the term, now organized um, around the WTO. And my sense of this is that, at least since Seattle in 1999, um, some of the sort of central precepts of the um, cognitive structure, which we often think of in terms of the notion of embedded liberalism, are becoming, um, are becoming more shaky. Uh, they're becoming politically less dominant and subject more to a serious question. You certainly see that in the political discourse in a country like the United States um, today. And the question is um, whether these regimes, which are, which rest in some way uh, on this um, cognitive foundation, can continue to perform as effectively as they have in the last, well, in the, in the period since about 1970, um, going forward into the future. And so there's, I think, a very interesting set of um, research questions around the effectiveness of uh, international regimes, environmental or otherwise, that have to do with the linkages between the specific regimes, which tend to be rather um, focused on concrete questions, whether it's ozone depletion or fish stocks or transboundary rivers or forests or what have you, and the kind of larger systems of uh, ideas that uh, underpin these arrangements or that would be needed to be brought into um, force in order to uh, make these regimes effective. So um, that's a set of questions. The first kind of half of what I wanted to say, perhaps more than uh, half, I'll try to be a little uh, briefer in the next set. The, the second set, as I announced at the outset, is to look at somewhat, a set of somewhat broader questions in which we think not just of the individual regime as the unit of analysis, and think about um, the development of a set of propositions about the effectiveness of this universe of cases, but look at um, regimes in context, so to say. And here, um, let me um, raise two or three questions. There's been a lot of interest uh, in the community who work on these things since about the middle 1990s in what we tend to call institutional interplay. That is to say, instead of looking at regimes as in some sense self-contained, standalone entities that can be uh, treated as a universe of cases, to understand that these arrangements, these governance systems, uh, regimes of one kind or another, uh, often interact with each other in more or less um, complex ways. And uh, uh, two questions where I think there's very real opportunity for research project progress in the next phase. Uh, first, uh, around the notion of what the community is now calling regime complexes. Some of you may know this uh, literature which started out um, in a very widely read article in 2004 by um, Cal Rustiala and David Victor in what they called the regime, the regime complex for plant genetic resources. Um, it's, a, it's apparent that if you look at regime complexes, which are uh, 
sets of interlocking or interrelated but non-hierarchical arrangements that deal with an, a more or less broad issue domain, that these complexes may, be, may vary significantly on some kind of a spectrum from fragmentation to integration. So you may have regime complexes that are relatively highly fragmented, where there's relatively little uh, coherence among the uh, elements of the regime complex. You may have a regime complex which is quite highly integrated, as in the case, for example, of the Antarctic Treaty System, uh, which is a highly integrated regime. And the research question here is, is what, what are the forces that determine movement along the fragmentation integration um, spectrum? What factors are likely to increase integration over time or to increase um, fragmentation over time? I think that we have uh, really just begun to think about uh, uh, that question. And another question has to do with what the research community um, usually calls multi-level governance. Um, the idea being that um, we need to look not only at international regimes, environmental or otherwise, uh, but uh, we need to look at activities taking place regarding a particular issue whether it's um, climate change or biodiversity, at a number of levels of social uh, organization. Uh, and here, um, the question I think, um, we're, we're quite familiar with this phenomenon of uh, multi-level governance in the context of um, federal systems of government. Um, at the domestic level, in which, there, in which there is an allocation of authority between or among different levels of government. So in the United States, for example, we have a division of authority between the federal government and state governments and local or municipal governments. Uh, that uh, the exact content or the practice of that division of authority is very often a subject of political contention, but it is nonetheless rooted uh, in um, the Constitution. And so when we now add the sort of international level, this, the, the difference, I think, uh, which is probably a very significant one, is that uh, you don't have any uh, point of departure. You don't have any kind of recognized division of authority when it comes to something like climate change between the climate regime itself and national or subnational governments. So this is a largely political phenomenon rather than one that has some kind of a legal basis. And so the question for research is, uh, what are the consequences of that? What, are the, what difference does it make that um, we're trying to understand multi-level governance in a political and legal setting, uh, which is very different in character from the setting in, in which we general th generally think about uh, um, federalism in um, domestic systems? <clears throat> Um, now, another point where I think there's real scope for uh, interesting and important uh, research in this area of broader relationships, where we're thinking about regimes in context rather than just the regime as the unit of analysis, uh, is uh, to understand the implications of uh, the sort of shifting uh, settings in when, within which regimes operate. Uh, and there are, I think, two um, dimensions here which 
I, I want to draw attention to, which I think are important. Uh, one is uh, shifting uh, socio-ecological context. Uh, and here, and I know this is a term, a, a phrase that's just also familiar to an audience here in uh, Stockholm. Um, the question is, uh, what are the consequences of what we uh, have come to think of as the great acceleration? So, regimes today uh, operating in what some of us have called a world of uh, no analog state uh, are operating in a very different kind of context, a very different kind of socio-ecological setting uh, than would have been the case in, in earlier times. And so uh, the question arises is um, whether or not um, this makes an important difference in terms of the effectiveness of international regimes and what it would take to create more effective international regimes. We're now concerned with the problems of nonlinearity, <clears throat> problems of tipping points, uh, problems of cascades, problems of pushing toward planetary boundaries, all of those things. And does, do these kinds of phenomena set up a different sort of constellation of forces that need to be thought about when we're asking questions about the effectiveness of international environmental regimes? And I think the answer to that is surely yes, but we need to drill down to think sort of systematically as to well, what difference does this change in the socio-ecological context make and how do we um, respond to this, to these differences in order to um, create regimes that are likely to be effective in dealing with things like uh, climate change. There's also uh, an issue about the shifting uh, socioeconomic context or setting within which uh, regimes uh, operate. Some of you will be familiar with the um, rather rapidly growing literature on the role of um, private governance and corporate social responsibility and global civil society. Uh, so the question here is, are we moving away from a situation in which one could assume confidently that uh, states in the ordinary sense of the term were the dominant actors uh, and the rest could be largely ignored in terms of understanding the conditions for the uh, effectiveness of international regimes. Now, <clears throat> um, I don't think anyone in the field today is saying that uh, nation states are obsolete. There was a literature uh, 20 or 30 years ago about uh, the obsolescence of the nation state. Well, that's not uh, an interesting literature today. But the shifting context in which we are operating in a more of a mixed actor world, and are there some kinds of issues, environmental for example, uh, in which private governance uh, is an option and is likely to be able to solve certain kinds of problems, or are we in a situation in which there are opportunities for mixes of private actors and um, state actors to operate uh, to make regimes effective. One thinks, for example, of uh, situations like marine pollution, where you have the conventional international or multi multilateral environmental agreements like MARPOL, but very significant roles for classification societies and insurance companies in making uh, the regime for things like uh, segregated ballast tanks and tankers uh, an effective regime. And so do we need to be thinking about this more complex uh, world in which we're 
thinking not only about uh, states in the conventional sense, uh, but uh, also uh, systems of mixed actors. There I think there's a, a large scope of research um, that um, will be rewarding in the next phase. And then um, finally, in this kind of larger, it's the sort of second half of what I've been trying to say here, um, some questions uh, which I think are, and I've been flogging perhaps for uh, some time, but I think they're um, likely to reward more, uh, more attention in the future, questions around um, scale and scaling up and scaling down. Um, the whole issue of scale um, is an issue which is far more familiar to people in the natural sciences and particularly in areas like uh, ecology than it is to people in the social sciences of trying to understand uh, what kinds of system properties, system characteristics scale up or scale uh, down. Uh, but uh, we do have this phenomenon of environmental regimes uh, which range across scales and here, not so much scales in the sense of the dimensions of space and time, but scales in terms of levels of social organization. And so, uh, Lynn Ostrom and I have had this conversation over the last 20 years or so, and it still seems to be an interesting conversation where she, as you know, has, uh, in terms of her empirical work, has tended to focus in a concentrated way on relatively small-scale systems, local uh, systems, and to understand the ways in which communities avoid things like the tragedy of the commons in small-scale settings. And I've tended to focus on the macro scale, looking at uh, international uh, governance systems, international environmental regimes. And the question is, uh, in terms of our understanding of the dynamics of these uh, uh, systems of governance, uh, what properties or what characteristics scale up and or scale down? So can we learn from the small-scale research when we're trying to understand how to address questions at the global scale? And can the small-scale people uh, learn from the global scale when we're trying to address uh, issues at the local scale. And uh, it's by no means self-evident what scales up and uh, what scales down. It may very well be that um, despite the obvious differences from the local to the global, that some of these issues around the role of, of ideas, the role of um, cognitive constructs or mental structures that I was talking about uh, a few minutes back actually turn out to be uh, quite important across scales. We have a project underway now that um, is being um, pushed forward by some of Lynn's students in which we're trying to look at somewhat more systematically at this question of what scales up and, and what scales down. And I think there's a real uh, set of opportunities uh, around these scale questions uh, as well. So that's really what I wanted to say. Um, uh, I hope this, I hope you didn't come for some other expectation of mine, but um, what I've tried to uh, articulate here is um, a set of what I think are quite exciting opportunities for the next phase or the next stage of research going forward in thinking about this kind of general question of the effectiveness of uh, international regimes, environmental and otherwise, and uh, why it is that some of these arrangements are far more effective uh, than others, and potentially uh, lessons that we could draw from uh, this research that might help us to make the arrangements that we put in place in the future uh, more effective as well. So with that, let me um, close this presentation and I'd be more than happy to uh, engage in a, 
in a discussion, questions and answers, and in a dialogue about any of the things I've said. Thank you. Thank you.